Hello, I'm Mark Finzer, and I'm chair of the board of RSF Social Finance, and also chair of the board of New Resource Bank. And we have the pleasure to uh, be dialoguing today with Dora Winter, who's the director of the Bay Area Waldorf Teacher Training. Hi, Dora. It's good to see you again. Mark, it's good to be here. You and I have connected over the years, and I was thinking back to uh, the first time I met you. I think it was at my brother's house in Great Barrington. And uh, it's been really amazing to see your life's journey. And I wonder if you could share with me a little bit more about how you have stayed with this work in Waldorf education, connected to Rudolf Steiner's work, anthroposophy. If you could share a little bit what's kept you going all these years and uh, what has inspired you? That's a wonderful question to start with. You know, it's uh, been 40 years since I became a Waldorf teacher. In 1973, I started at the Rudolf Steiner School in New York City. And I had actually been a high school student in the high school of that same school from 10th through 12th grade. And I knew from an early age that I wanted to teach. And when I became a high school student, I experienced teachers there who, who understood me better than I understood myself and understood my potential and understood that I had qualities that I didn't really realize I could develop, artistic qualities, for example. Mm. And I had been to a number of schools because uh, I had traveled and, uh, you know, my family had lived in many places. So that was a very impressing thing, impressive. I really felt, gosh, these teachers are human beings and they care about my development. And I was 14, 15, 16 at that it's time. Funny. In the three-year training of the Bay Area Center for Waldorf Teacher Training, we put a lot of emphasis on development of self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. and. That comes primarily through becoming more objective to one's own predilections so that when you get into the classroom, you are not just working out of your personality or your own biographical baggage. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've reached that point myself, but that's, that's the goal. Mm. Well, it certainly is a beautiful goal. And all those teachers that I've met who have gone through your training are, are amazing teachers. So it's, it's really, really special to, to see how everyone really sees their, themselves as really being on a path. Yeah. And as um, their self-development is, is part of it. Right. And it's not, as you say, just imparting a certain, uh, certain knowledge, but it's really their own path as they are accompanying their own, the children in their education. Yes. And I think that one of the ways that's particularly effective and very much emphasized in our program are the arts. Mm. Because you can't avoid leaving your impression on a piece of clay. And it's your impression. <laughs> it's what you're doing. Nobody else is doing it. And the result is yours. Mm. And you're not a good person or a bad person, depending on whether you're a good sculptor or a bad sculptor. Mm. But after a while, you begin to notice that certain tendencies come out in all the various arts. They mm. speak right back mm -hmm. to you. And it's the professional artist who, in a way, has gotten over that initial stage where you just see yourself come back. Mm. But in the teacher training, all the students do a great many arts and uh, spend a lot of time on them in a very disciplined way. And I think that what you said just now about a path, we could add to that, that there is a kind of a schooling involved, a mm. life schooling that is part of the development of a Waldorf teacher. Mm. So that the child really f experiences the way I experienced my high school teachers mm. as a person who is inwardly active, inwardly mobile, yeah. and not just full of content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And that takes a while, you know, that's a process. Yeah. So our first year students are quite, they are still at an initial stage, and then comes the second year and the third year. And, by the end of the third year, people look back on themselves mm. from three years ago, and they can hardly believe how, huh. how, how, you know, you could say how much richer their experience is. Yeah. Hmm. 
you know, that certainly has been my experience as well. You know, I'm a Waldorf graduate, and it's, um, it's just incredible to see that what, what you take into life and as a Waldorf student and uh, the gratitude that you have for your teachers. Could you say a little bit about, could you say something about how having been a Waldorf student has, I mean, you're a very successful human mm -hmm. being on, in mm -hmm. the normal way of uh, um, evaluating success. You now, a Waldorf uh -huh. teacher is somebody who seems to be uh, on the fringe, but you're a banker, you're a person mm -hmm. of the world. So how has the Waldorf education that you experienced for all the way from early <laughs> childhood through high school, yeah. what, what, are, you know, what are the, the capacities you feel you gained? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I think education, being a teacher, is far more important than being <laughs> a banker. And uh, we have our priorities really confused today still in our society. Huh. And uh, I think the day will come when teachers will be uh, not only honored uh, and respected even more than they are today, uh, but even compensated more because uh, it is uh, incredibly uh, disappointing to me to see how hard it is for teachers to, to earn a living, to earn a livelihood, and it should be completely reversed. The bankers should be paid the least. But for me, the, uh, the inspiration really came out of my excitement about understanding Rudolf Steiner's work. And it, um, it happened pretty early on in my life. Uh, there, in my Waldorf classroom, there was a social dynamic that was going on, and my parents were connected to anthroposophy and Waldorf education. And I remember they were out at a meeting one night, and uh, I was really wondering what was going on. Our, our teacher, our class teacher, had done a wonderful thing by bringing in a real diverse group of, of students. He had taken uh, students, this was in seventh grade, he had taken students from an orphanage, from uh, uh, emotionally disturbed facility uh, in Spring Valley, New York. So we had a variety of students and all hell broke loose, of course, socially in the classroom because no one was used to working with each other and the different dynamics uh, that go on of, of uh, culture, et cetera. And I remember uh, having this thought, I don't know where it came from, but it was, I wonder what Rudolf Steiner would have to say about this. So for me though, it was a question of a social question, which happened already in seventh grade, is how can we learn to understand each other better? How can we deeply put each other in each other's shoes and understand what the, what the needs are of our fellow human beings? And at the bottom of it, at the root of it, that's really what working with money is. It's really working, uh, a banker really has to listen to the needs of their community and try and finance them uh, in ways that are responsible and don't lose the money for their community members who are putting their savings with you and their trust with you, but really passing it on, passing it on to those who, who also need it and who have initiative. And so it's really been a wonderful journey of almost 30 years now uh, since RSF got started, and RSF stands for Rudolf Steiner Foundation, uh, but we aren't a typical foundation. We're uh, really a service organization, so we had to eliminate the word foundation because we were getting appeals for donations all the time. But at the root of it really is, is my uh, gratitude for Waldorf education because it was really there uh, that I could see not only how the teachers worked with me, I was one of those dreamy children. Uh, took quite a while to learn how to read, uh, but was of course given the time. Uh, my brother took even longer and he was four years older, so luckily he, uh, he led the way, so my parents weren't too nervous about it. But the idea within Waldorf education that you really are met where you are and uh, allowed to come forth in your skills and your capacities when they're ready uh, has really been, been amazing. And for me, what I say to the Waldorf School movement nowadays is I'm 53 and I think just now the fruits are starting to show themselves. You know, I've been working for a long time at it, but it's just now that I feel uh, fully in myself of being able to serve in a way that I would like to be. Both of us have experienced what it means to have people who look at us with our future in their minds. Yeah. So your teacher waited for you to learn to read and didn't rush you. And a certain kind of a strength comes out of that when a child mm -hmm. is not rushed. 
Of course, there are children who, where it's, it's outside the range of normal, but I'm not talking about that right now. And in my case, the fact that I dabble in painting and music uh, comes out of the fact that I was given the opportunity in high school to not be just smart mm. or what passed for smart, you know, not just be able to work with words and read easily and um, answer questions. That was not the most important thing. The most important thing was, well, how are you already developing as a human being, even at the age of 17? And I have to say that without that encouragement, mm. I wouldn't have found my way into something that balances my life even mm. now. Yeah. So I think if we talk to Waldorf graduates, that's a picture that generally emerges. Yeah. And then the question of um, what has kept me at the work of Rudolf Steiner, that's uh, a question that I think has to do with giving me confidence out of this entire uh, oeuvre, this huge literature of Steiner's work. As you work into it, and it doesn't matter where you start, it's not a sequential thing. It's mm. not like taking physics where you have to start here and you end up there. You can start with just about any book and keep moving and each facet of what you study enables you to become more conversant with the next facet mm. you study. Mm -hmm. It's like an art in itself. So every painting I paint becomes the teacher for the next painting. Yeah. It's similar with these books mm. and lectures. I mean, so much of the, the written uh, material now came from lectures originally. And I think that what the key in it has to do with providing me with a a certainty that there is meaning in life. And yet this is not a religion. Mm -hmm. This is a sequence of thought forms of thinking and the quality of the thinking itself can begin to change. Mm. I think that as people get into anthroposophy, they start to notice that they have a different relationship to life, mm. to the world, to what they do, to their own path. And in my case, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I hope that I've, that I'm moving towards what Rudolf Steiner describes somewhere as an example um, of somebody who has reached a certain point in their path of uh, studying anthroposophy, who could stand at the railing of a ship in a storm, and instead of m bemoaning the imminent death, would be able to say, look at how beautiful the ocean is, mm -hmm. look at how glorious the clouds are. Mm -hmm. And that is the goal of many religions, but mm -hmm. here we don't try to get to it through faith. We try to get to it through an understanding of a many, many concepts which go beyond the world of what is mm. countable, weighable, and measurable. Yeah. And we are now no longer the only travelers on this path. Yeah. So I think uh, much of the contemporary world of science mm. is beginning to recognize that the inner life of the human being has a great uh, reality. Right. And that this may, not be our, this may not be our first time our first life experience either. The whole concept of karma and reincarnation has a huge effect not only on the question of meaning of life but on the question of how do you see the child in front of you. Yeah. And it is something that a parent does not have to buy into or agree to to put a child in a Waldorf school. Mm. A parent in a Waldorf school is really enjoying the product of the education, mm -hmm. the child wants to go to the school, the child is engaged in the school, but how or why you teach what you teach, when you teach it, and especially the why of it, mm -hmm. which goes into these more profound and esoteric elements, that is something for the professional, for the teacher, mm -hmm. or the student of anthroposophy to penetrate. And mm -hmm. of course there are many parents who take classes and workshops and 
start to notice they are in a different kind of a place here. These teachers have a different yeah. quality of uh, perception and engagement mm -hmm. with their work. And I think part of that, which is both the challenge and the joy, is that every Waldorf school in the 60 countries around the world where they exist is autonomous. Mm -hmm. So they're all based on this foundation, yeah. but and they all follow a similar kind of a curriculum, right. but in the school, how they administer the school, and what the teachers are asked to do, how the teachers work with the curriculum, that comes out of individual decisions. That's really amazing, isn't it? When one pictures those, all those schools around the, around the globe and the different cultures and how it shows itself differently in a, in a school in Israel versus a school in uh, Cairo, Cairo yeah. or in Zimbabwe or yeah. It's, uh, it's just, to me, it's just fascinating because, you know, anthroposophy, I mean, that word, uh, when I first heard it, uh, was just, it's first of all a hard word to say, but when you think of, when you break it out, you know, anthropos, you know, the human, human wisdom and Sophia being wisdom, uh, you know, the fact that that's at the foundation, it's of course a made up name, it's a name that we know Rudolf Steiner coined, but it really has, uh, it has so much at the root of everything that you, you're talking about. That wisdom, and that wisdom of the human being. Yes, and I think the confidence that a Waldorf teacher has that a child will grow up yeah. comes out of that wisdom. So we know that a child at nine has certain attributes, and at 12, yet again, quite different. The same child really changes. Mm. and. Quite often parents are surprised by how their children change, but as a teacher, we have to anticipate that and we have to sense mm -hmm. what it is that the children need and know what the children need at every stage along the way, from early childhood all the way through high school, that this is not a random sequence of development. And you know, when I listen to the conversation, as I really keenly try to do about education in the world today. There are always uh, the, uh, formulas, formulaic answers to how to make education mm -hmm. better. And I think the advantage we have is that how we try to make the education better is based on a profound understanding of the physical, soul, and spiritual development of human being. Mm. And the children experience that. Mm. They experience that they are looked upon in this holistic way. So we, we have an education that is just about 100 years old, and people sometimes complain that nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. but. In a hundred years, humanity, fundamentally, I'm not talking about the stuff around us, right. but the human beings, um, there hasn't been that much of a change, really. Mm. I mean, if we go back to ancient Greece, I think we'd find human beings who were really quite different. Yeah. But if we think that this education is meant for the 20th and 21st and 22nd yeah. and centuries, I think we're talking about how the children really develop. And so I can expect certain things of an eighth grader or an 11th grader yeah. or a first grader, you know. And I think this also raises the question of the so-called daughter movements of anthroposophy. <laughs> the fact that there isn't only the education that comes out of this vast body of work called spiritual science or anthroposophy, but medicine, agriculture, the arts, the social life, the, it is, it is a holistic human endeavor. Mm -hmm. So this anthropos uh, part of anthroposophy really means that there's hardly any facet of human cultural activity that Steiner did not research and penetrate. And I think sometimes people feel it's not possible for one man to do all that, but um, and when I have looked at what he accomplished in any single day, 
I certainly mm. feel it's not possible to do all that, but yet he did it. Mm. So he had um, capacities of discipline and self-schooling that I think we could just take as exemplary, yeah. and he got a lot done. Yeah. yeah, and for me, what's also been amazing is to see how these various movements started, you know, that they really came by uh, people asking him questions. That's and right. that thought of the quest or the question uh, really set something in motion. It was almost as if he had to wait for that question to come, and that would then open the doorway for him to be able to co-create and to work together with. And uh, often for me, I, because of being in business and in finance, I think someone like Emil Molt, who helped co-found the first Waldorf School, uh, is often not thought of that as much, of course, and that's understandable because Rudolf Steiner's body of knowledge is so vast. But, um, but the very fact that he had that kind of support and Waldorf education needs that kind of partnering, uh, even more so today, uh, with its community and with mm -hmm. its wider world. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, as a, also as a Waldorf parent, both my children then also went to Waldorf schools, uh, I, it was very comforting actually to know that the teachers actually had that view that you describe. You know, that they really had that view of the developing child, that this wasn't their first lifetime. And I didn't have to believe it. If, if, and my fellow parents that were in my, the classes that we had our children and they didn't have to believe that. But the very fact that they knew that a teacher was holding their child in a particular way uh, was actually quite comforting because they weren't gonna be put in a box they weren't going to be held in a place and never be able to get out of it, but they were every year going to be different, and they were going to be seen as different. And imagine if we had a world where you and I did that with each other, everybody did that with each other, because every day we're, we're working on ourselves and yes. we're different. So that, what you describe is, is, is really fundamental, I think, to, to uh, anthroposophy and Waldorf education. Yes, and it's also, uh present in the adult education. Mm -hmm. So people come into this work, many of them come out of other professions or other teaching situations, mm -hmm. and they would like to do something for humanity, and they feel that Waldorf education is something for mm -hmm. humanity. And it's remarkable to see how their own confidence in themselves and their own sense of who they are and what they can take on develops. Mm. And in all of this, it's perhaps important to remember that uh, you just said how much Rudolf Steiner knew. He was extraordinarily knowledgeable and absolutely not a mystic. And I mm. think there is a misunderstanding or seeming contradiction in the fact that one can have a scientific, thought-based arena mm. that doesn't come out of the physical world. Yeah. But yet, if I look at you, I mm. know that you're you and you're nobody else. And that's because <laughs> there's a spiritual part to mm. you. And I think that the template, the box you mentioned that we sometimes apply to all sorts of situations comes, is, is a convenience. Mm -hmm. And if you, and it can be exhausting to really see every human being as an individual yeah. and to try to remember that when you meet them again, they aren't the same person that they were last time. Right. So in, in an ideal world, a Waldorf teacher who greets the children, you know, we have this formal little moment in a Waldorf mm. school with the handshake yeah. at the door where the teacher greets the children. But that's a moment for the teacher to really take in the whole of this child mm. and what do we need to do today? Yeah. And one can become very skillful at, in a moment, noticing yeah. what is there, what is bothering yeah. the child or not, yeah. and have a private moment. This kind of recognition of a human being, the adults who come into the mm. teacher training are not used to either. Yeah. And they have to get used to it. They have to yeah. get used to the fact that now it really counts what they feel yeah. and think and say. And it really lasts a lifetime. It really lasts a lifetime. I mean, I know with my children, they wanted to go and experience the 
big bad world when they graduated from eighth grade and they wanted to go to the public high school for, and for both of them it was two years and then they were clamoring to go to the Waldorf mm -hmm. High School. And their main reason, both of them said, I don't feel that I am being seen. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were excelling, they were doing fine, they were getting great grades and all the rest of it. But they didn't feel that they were being seen from that moment that in the Waldorf School, as you described, with the shaking of the hand, with the greeting in the morning, how powerful that is. And, um, you know, on a personal note, you know, my wife also went to Waldorf, Waldorf uh, School uh, in Germany, and she was six years ago uh, diagnosed with a form of dementia which has been uh, on one hand tragic for our family, but I have been amazed to see how she chose uh, to live with that condition from the moment she was diagnosed in a way that I am convinced came out of her experience of Waldorf education and her own work on herself. Uh, because still to this day, even though she doesn't understand one word, has to be fed, has to be changed, all of that, she gets herself out of bed, and I, I know from people that have a similar spouse with a same condition that um, they don't get out of bed anymore at this stage, but she gets herself out of bed. She looks you in the eye and she still wants to hold your hand and, and see you. And so something radiates out of her. And we often say that Waldorf education prepares you for life. I'm actually saying that it also prepares you for the end of life. And uh, that's often not thought about or talked about. But it's it really the what you're doing, Dora, with your teacher training and what you've stood for all these years, just has such a ripple effect within the the teachers, the human beings that have benefit from it, and then the students, and then even a student like my wife, who many many years later, uh, I wish her teachers would actually could experience her. I'm sure that a lot of them have have passed on now, but that they could actually even see her now, and see her her basic humanity still there, even though her her physical body is deteriorating. That's a powerful story. And I think it would be a sin of omission if I didn't point out that as a former Waldorf student, maybe you also, I mean, there's no way to know, but you must have a lot of strength in yourself to deal with that. So mm -hmm. that's been part of your biography now to have to mm -hmm. manage and where does a strength like that come from? Just that you can talk about it in a context like this, I think speaks to a kind of uh, a real understanding that life has ups and downs hmm. and that we have to find a relationship to both the ups and the downs. Right. And the hope is that we prepare the children so that they don't have to be merely consumers in the world. Right. Because the world, as it now is, would like to tell us that that's our primary chore. Right. There's nothing wrong with having fun and enjoying yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm a consumer too. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated by technology. Mm -hmm. And I'm easily addicted to the apps on my iPhone, <laughs> all that stuff. But I think that knowing that there's a whole other side, which you just spoke out of this individual capacity, both in you and your wife, she no longer has the ordinary accoutrements, trappings of yeah. what we take for granted in being human. And yet there is this deep humanity coming through, which only kind of proves to me mm. that we are not just what we can do. Right. that there is a deeper meaning to it. Right. And I think that this is a, a concept that um, many people in the world are really ready to embrace. The path mm. of getting into Rudolf Steiner's work is not without its frustrations. Uh, he had to invent a language. He wrote in German, so of course translation is an issue. but. Even if you read it in German, which I do, it's still very difficult. You sometimes have to read the same sentence a few times to understand it. But there is a kind of movement through the thoughts hmm. which in and of itself starts to change your own way of moving your own thoughts. Yeah. 
And there are many, many exercises in the work of Steiner for people wanting to get further with it um, to strengthen their thinking, to harmonize their feeling, and to activate their will. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're doing with the children. Yeah. Strengthening their thinking, harmonizing their feeling, activating their will. Yeah. Only that it starts with the will and mm. it ends with the thinking. Mm. The young child is the one who's full of vigor and vim and activity. Yeah. And then we hope by the time that we're 17 or 18 that we can apply our thinking and discuss Emerson. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned reading of Rudolf Steiner and how challenging that can be. I have a friend who uh, for years tried to read Rudolf Steiner and just would you use it to fall asleep at night, so mm. to speak, and, <laughs> and suddenly it opened for him. Mm. And he said it was almost like an open secret. It was mm. as if uh, the way Rudolf Steiner wrote really required exactly what you just described, required the engagement of the will, the engagement of the feeling and the thought processes with every sentence, and suddenly it opened. And then it was relatively easy. I mean, it's not, it's, we all know it's hard to, to understand because he really challenges us. But I often tell friends who, who want to have access to Rudolf Steiner's work um, because, of course, his work is now dated. It's, it's really from a particular philosophical time. That's why how it lives through you and through me and through others is so important today, how people, people meet anthroposophy. But I am, I'm, uh, I'm amazed at you know, how the world is also caught up in some ways to a lot of the things that he, mm -hmm. that he spoke to. Yes. And I think we can be more open and more public about some of the more fundamental core things, even the, just what you just said, such as some of these core exercises. I don't know if you would be willing to speak a little bit about those and uh, share that because I think just even the educating of the will uh, is an important one today that a lot of people struggle with. I think, that I, I think that to take any one exercise will get us into trouble <laughs> okay. because it will be out of the context yeah. of the whole of it. Yeah. And it would be like trying to describe colors to a person and saying, well, mm. there's blue. And, but there's so much more than just blue. Yeah. So I think that um, I encourage people to uh, come and knock on the doors of any um, Waldorf or anthroposophical related institute, you yeah. know, even if it's your local biodynamic farm, yes. and just see what happens there. Yeah. Because this work of Steiner's, uh, what sets it apart in many ways is the practicality of it. People mm. get cured in the anthroposophically uh, directed hospitals. Yeah. People get healthy eating the biodynamic food. Yeah. It's not uh, some kind of um, mystical, uh, spiritual fuzziness. Mm -hmm. It has uh, created these schools around the world, hospitals around the world, clinics around the world. And really, if you go into a bookstore that stocks all the books that are related to Steiner and the secondary yeah. literature, it would be a very big space. Yeah. It's extraordinary yeah. how much has been spawned yeah. out of this work. So we can only encourage people to find their way to it. And I think leaving people free to do mm -hmm. that is one of our fundamental attitudes. Yeah. And I think the, I think the, um, we're almost, as you said, we're at the beginning. A hundred years is, in the large scheme of things, is not that it's much. It's just the beginning. It's yeah. just the beginning, and it's. I think there'll be brand new professions even yeah. that will come out of this. But so I, we can look forward to the hundredth <laughs> anniversary of Waldorf Education, yes. which will be in 2019. Yeah. Well, thank you. Really appreciate well, you taking the time. It's been wonderful to talk to you, Mark. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Dorothy.